Continuing our farm system previews, it's the New York Yankees and probably the most polarizing prospect in baseball in Spencer Jones. Let's talk about it. You are Locked On MLB Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on in to Locked on MLB Prospects, your home for all things minor league baseball. I'm your host, Lindsey Crosby, award-winning baseball writer and podcaster, and thank you for making this your first listen every single day. We're proudly part of the Locked on Podcast Network, where it's your team every day, and today's episode is made possible by our friends at FanDuel. Make every moment more. New customers, join today, and you'll get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. So looking at the New York Yankees, 82 and 80 last year, not necessarily the season that you were hoping to have, but you had the opportunity to call up some of your top position player prospects at the end of the year. So Austin Wells got some time in the majors. Jason Dominguez got some time in the majors, hit four bombs in his first 31 at bats, and then had a UCL injury, and had to have Tommy John surgery and his due back at some yet-to-be-determined time this season. But uh, despite those guys debuting last year, you still have plenty of reason to be excited about the prospects in this system. And I mentioned it in the open there, but Spencer Jones is a guy that we talk to a lot of people about. Just about every time that I am talking with somebody else in the prospect space, whether it's somebody from MLB.com who's coming on the podcast, whether it's a fantasy baseball person, whoever it might be. One of the things that I always bring up, just like an off-the-record chat, is their thoughts on Spencer Jones. And there is more, I would say there is less certainty and a wider range of potential outcomes for outfielder Spencer Jones than almost any other player that we discuss in these conversations and on the pod. So first rounder out of Vanderbilt in 2022 and just what he did last year, just so you know where it was. 117 games between high A and double A. So between Hudson Valley and Somerset. 267, 336, 444 was the slash line for Spencer Jones. 16 homers, 49 extra base hits, 49 walks to 155 strikeouts, and 43 of 55 on stolen bases. There is a lot in that slash line, right? Uh, For instance, the power for Spencer Jones is very good, as you would expect from a guy who is 6'6", 6'7", 225 or so. Like, his average exit velocity was 94 miles an hour, right? But when you look at that uh, he only hit 16 home runs... A big portion of that is his ground ball rate. He had the uh, 49% ground ball rate last year. I think MLB average is just around 44. And so you can see, like, in under the hood, you can see the numbers and the improvement that Spencer Jones was making throughout the year. The first half of the year, his contact rate was under 70%. It was like 67, 68%. But... The second half of the year, which was mostly Hudson Valley, he only got 17 games in Somerset. Uh, But the back half of the year, it was like a 75% contact rate. So you can see where he's getting, he's improving throughout the season. But the big question you have to figure out is how much work do you do on intentionally uh, raising the launch angle, changing the swing to have more, more loft in the swing? Because, yes, the ground ball rate is high, 49%, but he also struck out like 29% of the time. And typically, when you raise the, like, you try to add more loft to a swing, that means that the amount of time that the bat is in the zone usually ends up being less. And so, usually, you see some more swing and miss when you artificially increase the loft on a swing. So, a little bit of stuff to work out there. And the ability for Spencer Jones to do that, like I said, that is probably the thing 
where we see the most variance in the projections. I've talked to folks who think that he's always going to strike out 30% of the time and the power's not necessarily going to play. I see people that look at the exit velocity numbers and say if he can make this simple correction and then they point to the in-contact improvements he made during the season to say he is one or two tweaks away from being a monster. So, honestly, probably the prospect that I feel like I'm going to end up watching the most in 2024, simply because, one, I have shares of Spencer Jones and some Dynasty Leagues, but also, I just want to see it work. And I want him to get out from under the Aaron Judge comparisons. Because he's 6667, just like Aaron Judge, he gets a lot of comparisons And it's not necessarily founded. Yes, he has power. Yes, he's big. But they are different players. And I think part of the reason why the expectations have been so high for Spencer Jones and people have been disappointed where he is at this point in his career is because they are comparing him to Aaron Judge uh, when that's not necessarily warranted because Aaron Judge, to a lot of people, myself included, is a special player, an MVP caliber player. And it's just, that's part of the reason we don't do comps. It's just not fair to compare him to that. From a defensive perspective, he played entirely center field last year. 101 games in center, 16 at DH. But when you watch him play, he definitely feels like he's not necessarily just naturally fast. He has long strides. And so coming out of the box, it takes him a little bit to get up to speed. And I feel like ultimately the best place to put him is going to be a corner. Some of that is the physical stress of playing center field every day. Some of that is because it's not necessarily quickness and top end speed. It's those long strides. It just, it feels like a corner is going to be a better fit. I think eventually he can be your right fielder. The arm is good enough to be a right fielder, I believe. And then judge eventually being your DH just because you want to try to keep him keep his legs fresh and keep him off the field too much. Because unlike Spencer Jones, who's in the 220s, Judge is massive. I think he's like 260s or 270s. It's all good weight, but you just you want to ease the wear and tear. So you're going to treat him in some ways like an Aaron Judge, but I think ultimately he is a different player. It's important that we remember that. Uh, another top prospect in this system, and a guy that I feel like doesn't get really talked about enough, and maybe it's because of how little he's played, and where he played. Shortstop Roderick Arias had a good year at the complex, what he was able to play. So, 27 games in the complex league, which, by the way, that was a very good complex league team. Them and the Braves had the two best complex league teams in Florida last year. 267, 423, 505. Six homers, 10 extra base hits, 27 walks to 29 strikeouts, and 17 to 23 on stolen bases. So, He had a thumb injury that ended his 2022 in the DSL and then had to have hand surgery that ended 23. And so he's only played 58 games in the minors. And that's all been between DSL and and the Complex League. So a little bit of concern there. You've seen him. He should have played 100 plus games and he's played 60, right? But the things that we've seen have been really good. His exit velocities. Again, as a as a youngster at the complex, 90th percentile exit below of 104. He's already above average for 90th percentile exit below. Every day, as we'll remember, it's like 103 and change is MLB average for that. So he's already above average. And he doesn't necessarily chase a ton, right? So it's a good approach. Now, he does have some swing and miss in the zone, a thing you see all, all young players have. I think it's correctable, though. And so you're looking at a guy who should be able to give you an above-average hit tool and a plus power tool. He's a phenomenal athlete, too, which always helps. And so you're looking at a situation, a guy who 60 speed, plus speed, the defense, from what I little bit I've seen, appears to be plus defense. Again, defense takes the longest time to figure out. You just need a huge sample to figure out a guy's defense. But it looks to be plus defense. And then the arm is a cannon, 70-grade arm. And so... It's a package that legitimately, if it sticks it short, the arm is a difference maker. 
And if for some reason he has to kick out to third base, which could happen, you never know, it looks like he's going to have the profile to be able to make, to stick at third base and be a really good major leaguer, both offensively and defensively at third. So the big thing here, obviously, you want to work on that swing and miss in the zone a little bit, but the big thing is really stay healthy and get a full season. Hopefully here you can see him in Tampa with the Tarpons, hopefully the entire year, maybe a late season bump up to high A, because again, all of the numbers are really good, the exit velocities, that kind of stuff. You just need to see him do it for an entire season, right? In just a minute, let's talk about players you might see in 2024. There is a lot of pitchers in this list, and we'll get to that next right here on Locked on MLB Prospects. But first, today's episode is brought to you by our friends at FanDuel. Happy Super Bowl week to all who celebrate from FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. If you're like me, Super Bowl Sunday is all about uh, getting a great seat on the couch, grabbing some fantastic football snacks and foods, and placing some super bets. We are doing wings, both um, garlic butter and lemon pepper wet. That's just what we do for our wings. Those are the two best kinds of wings. I don't make the rules. I just tell you how it works. But also, for the bets... Some fun prop bets on FanDuel for this game. What's going in, they have, if you just want all passing props, you can do that. If you want all rushing props, you can do that. If you want kicking props, you can get kicking props. Now, they're all for the kickers. They're not for the punters, which is frustrating because punters are people too. But you can go in there. You can get touchdown scoring props. Who is going to score or not score? You can get all kind of bets about what's going to be the outcomes of the first drive. You can get individual props on the types of scores. Will there be a touchdown or not? I think it's like plus 20,000 that the game will end without a touchdown. But just there's tons of different combinations of props, defensive props. Who's going to get a sack? Will anybody record interception? Things like that. Who would do it? Who will get the first sack for each team? Individual quarter scoring, half scoring, tons of options for the Super Bowl. So, new customers. Join today and you'll get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL and the official sportsbook partner of the Locked On Podcast Network. Okay, so getting back to the New York Yankees farm system and trying to figure out what we, what players you're going to see in 2024. There's a lot of pitchers here, and we've talked about, everydayers have heard this before, about how the Yankees deserve to be up there in the conversation for organizations that are some of the best at developing pitching. The one kind of caveat to that is we haven't really seen these Yankees pitchers make it to the majors, right? They end up being trade pieces and trade assets to go out to other teams, which... That is a viable use for prospects, right? The it, If you develop a prospect and trade him for a major league asset, that is not a failed a failure on your part. That is just a different utility of a prospect than what most people expect. But some of these pitchers, let's talk about Chase Hampton. Let's talk about Will Warren and then Clayton Beater if we have some time. So Chase Hampton, sixth rounder in 2022 out of Texas Tech, got 20 starts, between high A and double A last year, almost even. He had a he had nine in Hudson Valley and eleven in Somerset, but four and three with a three six three ERA and hundred and six and two thirds innings, hundred and forty five strikeouts, so twelve point two per nine, two thirty seven walks, three point one per nine, thirteen home runs allowed, just over one home run per nine innings. And the thing for Hampton is, it all comes back to a really good fastball. So he it sits in the mid-90s. The velocity is good. It doesn't blow you away, but it's got about 20 inches of induced vertical break. And I think it was two weeks ago on the Pirate Show, we were talking about the shape of the fastball of Paul Skeens, and we broke down how this works. Once you're hitting about 17 or 18 inches of induced vertical break, that's getting plus to elite numbers of induced vertical break. This thing's 19 to 20. So very good fastball up in the zone. He, he w- To go along with that, he has uh, a high spin slider in the mid to upper 80s. It's like 86, 87 or so. A vertical breaking curveball in the high 70s. And then a 
rarely used changeup. It's also in the upper 80s, but could be a little bit softer. That's fine. And then he added a cutter last year to give himself another option. I believe it was against lefties was the goal of that. And so he's covering a lot of different velocity bands, a lot of different directions, and it's just a really good package. Now, none of them outside of the fastball are necessarily amazing, but quite a few of them are above average. And then, of course, it all keys off of that very good fastball that is hard to hit when you elevate it. So it's a good package for Chase Hampton. What I want to see is just continued development through the minors, right? Like he's invited the spring training. I don't think he's going to make the team. Again, he's got 11 starts in double A. But I could see an assignment to triple A to open the year, or I could see double A to triple A with the goal of him being up a little bit later. Because again, while the fastball is maybe the only pitch that's plus or better, it all combines to be a very good package because he can land stuff for strikes and he can get swings and miss with a lot of these pitches. Uh, the sequencing's really good and all of that. And so it's a it's good pitches, but a great package when you put it all together with his command, his control, and his sequencing. So just need more experience here before you get Chase Hampton up. And I think you're looking at end of the year, call him up. And I'm not gonna say the worst case scenario, but it's very likely you see him end of the year for some starts with a best case scenario of seeing him even earlier, you know, maybe mid-season, depending on how the season goes with health at the major league level. Will Warren, a guy who's probably a little bit closer than Hampton because he spent so much time in the AAA last year. So eighth rounder in 2021 out of Southeastern Louisiana, who used to use the acronym SELA, and they've gone to something else. I think it's Southeastern now, but uh, 25 starts, 27 total appearances between AA and AAA. 10 and 4 with a 3.35 ERA in 129 innings, 149 strikeouts, so 10.4 per nine, to 59 walks, 4.1 per nine, and 15 home runs allowed. Throws a lot of different pitches. I think you could do a little bit more sequencing work on some of these, but. He throws both two-seam and four-seam fastballs in the mid-90s, which I honestly wish more guys would do, right? But I just, I like how some of this stuff all works together. So the two-seamer pairs really well with his sweeper, which is a phenomenal sweeper. It's 17 inches of movement, and I believe about six pitchers in MLB averaged as much movement on their sweeper as he gets. And so the swing and miss is absurd on it, right? So uh, the two seamer and the sweeper work really well because they're obviously they're going in different directions, but out of the hand, they're in the same tunnel. And then he, uh, another guy that added a cutter last year. And so the four seam fastball in the cutter work well because even if you're trying to watch for the sweeper, the cutter is going to come in harder and it's going to break less, right? The, t- the four seamer doesn't have great, it has like below average carry up in the zone but it also has about eight or so inches of arm side run. So it makes up for it, but the cutter and the four seamer together, it's hard to barrel those up. And you can see that his barrel rate last year was like 4%. It's just hard to hit Will Will Warren square. He's also got a curveball. He's also got a change up. They together were like 5% of his pitches. He doesn't really use them that much, but it's still a four pitch mix that is arguably three power options and then a sweeper that is a very good and unique sweeper. So it's a great package. I fully expect you'll see him pretty early in the year. Had a good stuff plus number. Eno Saris of The Athletic has his Google Doc out there with all the AAA stuff plus. Had a really good stuff plus number. It was something like 123. Really good stuff plus number. Clayton Beater, second rounder in 2020 out of Texas Tech by the Dodgers. He was the return for Joey Gallo in that Joey Gallo trade. And... Between AA and AAA last year, 27 appearances, 9-7 and seven with a 3.62 ERA and 131 and two-thirds innings. 165 strikeouts, 11.3 per nine, 275 walks, 5.1 per nine, 18 home runs allowed, 1.2 per nine innings. The issue so far for Clayton Beater is he is a two-pitch pitcher. He has a fastball that low to mid-90s, I've seen it as low as 92, as high as 95 or touching 96, but it looks... Like, it's hard to pick up out of the hand, right? It has around average amounts of induced vertical break, 16, 17 inches. And then he has a slider in the low 80s 
that isn't a true sweeper, but it's sweeper-ish. Uh, it, it's got some really good depth to it. Uh, to go along with all of that, used less than 10% of the time, he's got a vertical break and curveball and a change. And I think that's the big issue here is that's that since that slider has a lot of horizontal movement, it's more susceptible to handedness stuff here. So if he can get more comfortable with the vertical breaking curveball or the changeup, if one of those can improve, Clayton Beater has a rotation potential here because he can throw plenty of innings. He got almost 132 innings last year. The issue here is he needs to have a third pitch so he's not susceptible to lefties and so that he has a little more variety because two pitches as a starter only works if they're two really good pitches and his pitches are fine. They're not both elite, right? Another guy you may see this year just because he had an amazing year last year, catcher Ben Rice, 12th rounder in 2021 out of Dartmouth, 73 games, single A, high A, double A, 324, 434, 615, 20 home runs, 39 extra base hits for Ben Rice, 44 walks to 62 strikeouts, and 11 to 14 on stolen bases. Defensively, he's a good blocker, he's a good game caller, he is not good at managing the running game. 11% caught stealing last year, the arm isn't necessarily great, and so he played 37 games at catcher, but he played 18 at first base and 18 at DH. And the real money is made here, just like every other... Just like every other Yankees catcher, he's an offensive first guy, right? But you look at the numbers under the hood, everything was good. Contact, 79% overall, 85% in the zone. You like that. Power, 91 mile an hour, average exit below, 104 on his 90th percentile. Uh, discipline, swing percentage of 41%, chase of under 20%. Now, I will say, I want to see him with some time in double A, some more time, simply because we've talked about this before. Everydayers have heard this. In the lower minors, you can get away with swinging a lot less frequently because so many pitchers can't reliably come into the zone. When you get to double A, you face, for the most part, a lot better pitchers who can reliably throw pitches in the zone that you're going to swing and miss on. And so I want to see what that discipline does. Does it does he swing more often? Does he chase a little bit more? How does he adjust to facing better pitchers who can better paint the black and come into the zone and beat him with stuff? So a little bit farther away, probably end of the year, but another catcher first base option that's going to be offensive first catcher. Again, some issues with the running game there. Maybe he catches your lefties. I don't quite know. But either way, really interesting player. We had to talk about Ben Rice. In just a minute, quite a few lower level prospects to talk about. No surprise, a bunch of them are pitchers. We'll do that next right here on Locked on MLB Prospects. Final segment of Locked on MLB Prospects here uh, in the New York Yankees preview. And reminder, if there's a guy you want to hear about we don't get to in this show, I'm on Twitter at Crosby Baseball, show's on Twitter at Locked on Farm. We'll put him into the Monday mailbag. Uh, that's what I do after every week of previews is all the guys that we were asked about we didn't get to, we stick in there. Okay, guys you need to know about from the minor leagues. Left-hand pitcher Henry Lalane. Let's talk about him. 2021 IFA. Took two years to get out of the DSL. Got eight appearances in rookie ball last year. 1-0 with a 4-5-7 ERA in 21 and two-thirds innings. 34 strikeouts, so 14.1 per nine. To four walks. 1.7 walks per nine innings. Three home runs allowed. The things you need to know about Henry Lalane is obviously the control is good, right? One point, so four walks in 21 and two thirds innings. But when you consider the fact that he's six foot seven, it's exceptional control. We've talked about long levers before and how hard it is for young pitchers with those long levers to know where their body is and know where the ball is going. So that's already a great uh, feather in the cap of Henry Lalane. Now, the actual stuff itself is pretty good also. He's got a four-seam fastball set to the mid-90s. He's got a change-up in the mid-80s, so there's some arm side run for you. And he's got a slider, a two-plane breaking slider, uh, kind of upper 70s to low 80s. I've seen it be slower. I've seen it be faster, but he locates it really well. So uh, you've got a couple different directions covered. You've got different velocity bands. And again, you've got very good control. The question here is going to be one, you need experience, but the real question is, 
what does the physical development that's undoubtedly coming, what does that do to the velocity? Where is the ceiling on that velocity? Either way, they're super excited in the system about Henry Lane, and so am I. The other massive physical dude, six foot seven as well, Carlos Lagrange, was in the FCL last year, was in the Complex League, 497 ERA in 41 innings. He had 13 and a half strikeouts per nine innings and five walks per nine innings. I'm not going to say a two-pitch guy because he throws two different fastballs. He has a four-seamer and a two-seamer. He sits in the mid-90s. He's touched, I think he touched 99 or 100 with the four-seamer. The two-seamer looks good when it's down. Good movement. Has a vertical breaking slider in the mid-80s. I wasn't sure if it was a slider or a curveball. Some of the metrics that I saw, it was read by some one of the trackmans as a slider instead of a curveball. So there you go. And then he's got the beginnings of a changeup. Now you can see from the walk numbers, 5.2 per nine innings, he doesn't quite have the same proception and body control to have the command and the control that Lelaine has. But if you can get the stuff to be a little more consistent and the command to be a little bit better, and then obviously get that changeup going from the, the beginning hints of one to a legitimate full-fledged changeup, you've got another guy who could potentially be a dude. So let's watch out for him. While we're talking about pitchers to watch for, left-hand pitcher Brock Selvage. Third rounder out of high school in 2021. 24 appearances, 23 of those were starts between single A and high A last year. Eight and five with a 3-4-5 ERA and 127 and two-thirds innings. 137 strikeouts, so 9.7 per nine, to 35 walks, two and a half per nine, and five home runs allowed. So... He, he He's a two-pitch guy right now. Fastball and a gyro slider. The question here is going to be, one, can you get a little bit more swing and miss out of what you're doing? I think there's some velocity gains you can make. But then also, can either the changeup or the cutter emerge as reliable third options? And we mentioned it up there. Hampton added a cutter. Warren added a cutter. I feel like this is an organization that can develop and teach cutters. And so, if Brock Selvage can get a cutter as that third pitch. Fastball, gyro slider, cutter. It's more of a power look, but I, that's not something you see a lot from lefties, so I feel like it would be rather effective. I'm hoping he can work that out uh, soon. A couple position players to be mindful of. Shortstop George Lombard was, the, um, was a draft pick last year. Got in 13 games between rookie ball and A ball. 311, 466, 356. Two doubles, no homers. 13 walks to 12 strikeouts, and 4 of 6 on stolen bases. Uh, defensively, I think he can stick it short. The arm appears to be plus. The speed, the defense, is at least above average. Uh, you do have a question if the speed slows down as he physically develops. He was a prep draftee, so you have some of that coming still. If the speed ticks down, does he have to kick out the third base? I do think the hands are good enough where he could probably kick into second if you needed to. He doesn't have to kick out to third, which is nice. But your big question here is going to be, you just need experience in professional baseball and figuring out where these tools end up. I think everything has the potential to be above average. The hit tool, the power tool, where are they actually going to be though? I will note of the four, six and stolen bases, he was one for three in, in single A. Just didn't look like it were very good jumps. That's an experience thing, right? Two, uh, a catcher and two position players to look at real quick. Augustin Ramirez, IFA in 2018, got 114 games shot all the way to double A. It's been a slow development for him until now. 271, 364, 455, 18 homers and 42 extra base hits, 61 walks to 85 strikeouts, 12 of 16 on stolen bases. He's the catcher that has a good arm, but the defense is a work in progress. He's the opposite of Ben Rice, where he has good defense, but the arm is a work in progress. Exit velocities are good, 107 for a 90th, 91 for his average. Contact, 84% in the zone. So you like some of this. He's just not always making ideal contact. You have to think they're going to try to push him a little bit. He is a little bit older, as well as he is on the 40-man roster this year. So you're going to have to use an option after spring training to send him down, which means, obviously, the clock is ticking here. You want to see what he does. And then two guys to watch for. Brando Maya, the outfielder, and Emmanuel Tejada, the shortstop. Tejada played, batted 307 in the complex league last year. Five homers, 24 stolen bases. Hit tool was great, plus speed, 
questions about his arm means he's probably confined to second base. That's what we're watching for on that dart throw. Again, the hit tool's great. I don't know what the power is going to be, so that could he could be a light hitting second baseman at worst. He could be a average shortstop that can give you 2010 at best, maybe 2015. I'm sorry, backwards. 10 homers, 20 stolen bases, or 15 homers, 20 stolen bases at short. So watch for that. And then for Brando Maya, 276 in the DSL last year, 22 stolen bases, blazing fast, right? 70 grade speed plus arm. The exit velos are good. So he's coming stateside. Let's see what he does because the Yankees have had pretty decent success in the complex league with some of the talent they've had there recently. Again, there's a guy you want we didn't get to. Let me know. I'm on Twitter at Crosby Baseball. Show's on Twitter at Locked On Farm. We have an email and a Discord in the episode description in the show notes for you uh, to leave me the guys you want to hear in, in the Monday mailbag. And until next time, remember, it's always a great time to pay a minor leaguer. 